if you go there to uh, neopolin.ca and you choose one of the topics, which is the pro uh, municipal issues, you go into the municipal issues and you find a uh, topic which is called transportation. Okay. You, in the transportation, you have some subtopics, and one of them is financing public si the public system. Mm -hmm. And uh, about 70% of the people that have uh, voted on that issue, they feel that uh, the transportation, the public transit, should be paid by taxes, uh, federal, municipal, provincial, and uh, gasoline taxes, and uh, uh, all kinds of taxes, and it should be fare free. What, what do you think about that proposition? Well. The fact is that under our current system, um, a fares cover, I think it's less than 15% of the overall cost of public transit. So fares make up just a small percentage of the cost of transit overall. Um, I, I, when I first heard that statistic, it made me think, well, if we could just find the other 15%, we can actually, actually offer free buses. But there's some pretty clear research and studies that show that um, although it'd be attractive to have a, a, a free bus system, that the real... Uh, deterrent to bus riders and to bus ridership is lack of frequency of service, much more so than any uh, uh, reasonable cost to be able to get on that uh, bus. So right now, I don't think that fares are so expensive than they're prohibitive for people to use the bus. And I'm a regular bus rider. I'll take the bus two or three times a week. Um, but I do think that we could find ways to improve service and to in, in, in improve frequency of service. And I think that would boost up ridership even more than reducing the fare to zero. Um, I think there are two separate issues. One is the technological one, the, 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 the amount of equipment that the, the system has uh, and the frequency which the transport comes on and off. But the other one is the... Uh, they're not having to worry about tickets mm -hmm. or change. Or the exact change, sure. Yeah, and or how long your transfer is going to last. And if if there was a, a free, fair free system, I wonder how many people would opt to leave their cars at home, therefore helping the environmental issue by not polluting the air and uh, creating congestion in the city. Well, well, as I suggest, the studies are, are pretty clear that if we really want to increase ridership, we need to increase frequency and the number of routes, um, that that will have a greater impact in bringing people onto buses than uh, just reducing or eliminating the fare. But, um, but as I said, if, if fares are less than 15%, I think we always have the option as, uh, as governments to, to decide to eliminate fares completely if we can find uh, that's, that revenue from other sources. Another issue in this uh, uh, poll, uh, transportation, if you go back to transportation, is actually uh, bicycle paths. I presume that if the city would create more bike paths, more bicyclists would uh, go use it. I agree completely. Yeah. So what is it going to take the city hall of Victoria to accelerate the development of uh, more bike paths? Well, I think ultimately uh, it's a resource issue. It's, uh, like so many other things in the city, it's a matter of uh, not having the resources to put in more paths uh, at a quicker rate than we currently are right now. What is the, the percentage of uh, uh, money that is devoted to uh, the development of bike paths, paths con con uh, compared to uh, highways and traffics and bridges? It's probably, I, I wouldn't know the exact number, but I suspect it's probably a thousand to one. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, car travel is heavily, heavily subsidized in our society. We look at um, putting in a bike path as a cost, but we, didn't, we never really consider maintaining our roads or even mowing along the side of the road and everything that goes into our road infrastructure as a, as a cost. It, uh, I think that, um, we're over subsidizing uh, uh, vehicle transportation right now. Let's talk about drugs and uh, drug policy. I understand you're the executive director of the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. Are you still a director? I'm not a director. I resigned about uh, almost two years ago now, but I was the founder and uh, the executive director for 10 years. I feel that was a good long time. But you feel very strong about uh, having uh, uh, drugs, at least for medicinal medicine 
purposes available to uh, the population? Well, I, I feel that uh, substances like cannabis that have therapeutic value should be uh, available to, uh, to the population, at least in terms of uh, um, through, uh, they should be treated like any other medicine. But I'm also a, a believer in, um, in a better regulatory regime for drugs in general. I think that our current prohibition, uh, our war on drugs, has, um, is, is, is an example of lack of regulation and lack of control over illicit substances. We've taken these, um, in some cases, beneficial substances, in some cases, very dangerous substances. We've washed our hands of controlling them and we've given control over to the black market. And what we've seen is that the black market uh, is uh, not a good regulatory agency to take care of individuals in terms of quality control, in terms of uh, ensuring that um, uh, these drugs stay out of uh, the hands of kids. And um, that basically we're just creating, a, a, I think that the, the current regime, the current level of prohibition is like a big uh, a present to, uh, uh, to uh, criminal gangs and organizations because of the high profitability of these substances. We would do much better from a public health point of view, from an economic point of view, and uh, from a personal health point of view if we regulated uh, adult access to some of these substances in a very different manner. And that would also create harm reduction. And, uh, I think harm reduction should be absolutely the principle of that. It's interesting because we know about the incredible harms of alcohol in our society, and yet we have a lot of built-in harm reduction with alcohol. We have age restrictions. We have limitations on where one can drink alcohol legally, uh, be it bars, etc. cetera. And, um, and if we didn't have those restrictions, we would have a lot more dangerous use of alcohol in our society than we do already. Um, the problem is that we also have a society that um, promotes alcohol use. So I think that we need to find a middle ground um, with uh, drug control. We need to find a system that focuses on public health, that focuses on harm reduction, but that doesn't uh, lead to full prohibitions of these substances because ultimately people throughout our, you know, our, uh, our, our entire society, but frankly our race, has always sought ways to alter its consciousness. And we're not going to change that. We certainly haven't changed it in 70 years of prohibition. And so we need to, uh, to find better ways to control these substances that leads to less social impact on, on, uh, for all of us. Yeah, the counter argument to it is that uh, by supplying harm reduction paraphernalia, we're actually enabling the addic addiction. Well, I think um, it's uh, not a lack of, a, of having a clean needle that's stopping people from, from using substances right now. It's just making the current drugs that they are using more dangerous. And so I think that harm reduction is a pragmatic way to uh, allow people to live through their, their addictions. And what's the city doing about it? The city's not doing nearly enough about it. I am, I've been... If, if I have one disappointment over the last three years or so of being on city council has been um, the lack of progress that we've made on, uh, on harm reduction and harm reduction services. Um, it was one of the main campaign issues that I ran on. It's, it's one of the areas that I have the greatest expertise on. But I think that the city has not found its proper role in harm reduction. And instead of being a... a uh, a promoter of harm reduction services instead of being at, uh, at the, the front of supporting harm reduction services. Uh, we've, we've, all that we've really accomplished in the last two years is, is we've produced a needle exchange report and policy that talks about where we won't or how we don't want needles to be distributed in our, in our city, in our society. And, uh, and I don't think that that's particularly helpful to uh, those who are currently suffering from uh, addiction or hepatitis C and HIV AIDS on our streets. Where, where is that report or who made that report? Um, the report um, came out a few months ago and it's available on the city's website. And um, although it does reiterate our support for a distributed needle exchange system, it um, does little to address the fact that for the last three years we've been the only major metropolitan area in North America that doesn't have a fixed site needle exchange. Uh, in fact, today, in fact, right now, and I'm a bit late for it. There's a rally right outside that that door for the uh, for to in order to mark that three years of closure of our fixed site needle exchange. I think it's inexcusable. I, I say that as an addictions researcher. I say that as someone who suffers from hepatitis C 
who doesn't want to see anyone else uh, uh, or anyone else's family have to deal with the ravages of hepatitis C. And I see that as an elected official trying to save our, uh, our population some money and, uh, and to put forward compassionate evidence-based policies. Well, Philip, thank you very much for your time. It's absolutely a pleasure. You <laughs> thank late, you very much, Pedro. Late from your appointment. Let me read out why this is an important day to declare. Whereas harm reduction contributes to a safer community for everyone, and harm reduction is a science-based public health approach to addressing the individual and community harms stemming from illicit drug use. And harm reduction has played a pivotal role in stemming the HIV epidemic in British Columbia and in linking people to recovery, care, and drug treatment. And whereas stigma towards people who use illicit drugs undermines HIV prevention and other health promotion efforts, and whereas June 1st marks the third anniversary of the closure of Victoria's sole fixed needle site exchange, leading to a reduction in access to support services for people who need and use inje injection drugs, and whereas local, regional, and national studies have shown that adequate housing and a variety of support persons, services are integral to a successful harm reduction strategy, and that harm City Victoria Council has endorsed harm reduction as one of its strategic priorities and endorses the Vienna Declaration. And whereas we have adopted a comprehensive integrated harm reduction strategy and in consultation with the community, in collaboration with VHA, the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness, Provincial Ministries, Victoria Police Department, and downtown service providers, especially Aid Bank Your Island. <laughs> that part isn't in there. In mobilizing that strategy, we hereby complain, proclaim June 1st as Harm Reduction Day, Harm Reduction Awareness Day in the City of Victoria, in the province of British Columbia. I here to set my hand and seal. Dean Porton, Mayor of Victoria. You see 364 more of those a year. Well, and just as Bike to Work Day is every day in the City of Victoria, Harm Reduction Day is a day. And so they're working towards absolutely getting a fixed promise. needle exchange. There was a fellow asking, where is it? What, what is your answer to it? Well, we recognize that fundamentally it is a, uh, Vancouver Island Health Authority's responsibility to deliver and set that service up. But we recognize that it's important for the City of Victoria to be involved in that. We know we play a role. We can play a role by advocating, to saying this is something that our community needs and something that we as a council will be there with you when it comes in. We have to make sure they do it right. And the last one they did, they, they, they didn't provide enough support for the, to the agencies that were running it to make sure that it was successful. But there is lack of funding, you're saying? Well, it's one of those things that in government, there's never enough money and there's always enough money. It's about what is your priority, are they willing to do the commitment for it? And that's part of what we need to do, to make sure that VHA understands that there's support within this community for fixed needle exchange. The intention of direct democracy is to shift the decision-making power or legislative power from a few elected representatives to all of us, the majority of citizens. So what we need to do is to participate in a polling system like this so we can demonstrate to ourselves and to the politicians whether or not we want fair free transit system, more bicycle pathways, more public washrooms, fun harm reduction sites and mental health centers, etc. This policies should be the decision of all of us, not up to just a few politicians. What do you think? Remember, social change will not happen automatically. If we the people really want our agenda to rule, we the people must initiate and legislate our own rules of governance. Your participation is the essence of direct democracy.